Good afternoon to all of you. Hope everyone's doing well. I should say, I usually forget, but say hello to all of those who are watching on their TV screens at home or computer screens or some sort of screen. Hope everyone is doing well. It's a little chillier today than we've experienced here in recent days, but a nice sunny day nonetheless. Today, I want to focus on a three letter word. Just to be clear, I said three letter word. So I think that would be appropriate for services, of course. And this word is actually also a number. So what word, what number do I have in mind? I'll let you guess, you're probably going to get it right. But I do, on a very rare occasion, like to provide a visual aid, which might help as well. So that word, that three letter word, that number is one. Good, no, no spelling errors. I give the credit to my wife. She did the artwork here. I was a little concerned, but it worked out OK. So that's the uh, word that I want to focus on today. And you could go a lot of different directions with this word. It's used in many, many ways. But today I chose to go down the road of pop music and the pop music culture and the use of that word because they've used it to great effect over the years. I'm going to go back quite a few years, uh, hopefully reach out to all the demographic groups here in the audience, or at least most of them, uh, because pop stars have used this word, one, uh, as a title of some very popular songs over the years. So I'm going to briefly take a look at that. So let's just get started. Way back in 2014, for those of you who know the name, a uh, pop star by the name of Ed Sheeran, how many people have heard of Ed? Let's make sure you guys are not frozen out there. It seems a little chilly today. Ed Sheeran had a hit song with the title One. Does anybody remember that song? Just curious. I, I did not really know that song, but I see a few hands being raised. And so the song came out, as I said, in 2014, title One. And in Europe, the song achieved a great deal or a relative amount of success. It reached number 18 on the charts, at least in the United Kingdom. So it had popular appeal, uh, and, it, and it was, as you might guess if you're ahead of me, when you get to the point, it sounds like it's a story about unity, but of course, that's not usually the case when it comes to popular music, and according to some resources online, Sharon says, a song is a good way to end both a period of time and a relationship that he was singing about in the song. So it was an end of a relationship. Let's go back a little further in time. We'll continue to do that for a few moments here. Let's go back to 1992. For those of you who are around, imagine what you were wearing back then, or maybe don't imagine what you were wearing back then. But in 1992, another band, in this case, by the name of U2, also had a hit song by the name that was titled One. I suspect that many of you remember it. The lyrics, well, before I get to the lyrics, this song did even better than Mr. Sh Mr. Sheeran's uh, song. It reached number six on the top 100 of Billboard, Billboard charts. I'll share a few lyrics of this song. I'm sure many of you remember it. He says, the singer sings, the song goes, one love, one blood, one life, you got to do what you should. One life with each other, sisters and my brothers, one life, but we're not the same. We get to carry each other carry each other. Now, if you read the words, it sounds kind of like a unifying song, but according to Bono, the lead singer for U2, he said the song is a bit twisted, he said, which is why I could never understand why people want it played at their weddings. Uh, I have certainly met a hundred people who have said, had it at their wedding, so if you're one of those 100 people, uh, don't get upset. This is his words, not mine. So I tell them, are you mad? <laughs> it's about splitting up, even though the title is one. So let's keep going back in our time machine for those of us who've been around a little longer. We're almost done with our musical journey. Let's go back to the year 1969. And there was a rock band around, some of you recall, by the name of Three Dog Night. How many people remember Three Dog Night? Okay. So Three Dog Night actually took a song that had been written by another performer by the name of Harry Nielsen. Uh, this song actually did best of all, of all these three songs. It went to number five in 1969, again, with the same title, 
one. A few lyrics from that song, it's just no good anymore since you went away. Now I spend my time making rhymes of yesterday. One is the loneliest number. One is the loneliest number. One is the loneliest number since you went away. So three songs, pop culture, pop music, all with the same title, and all basically carrying roughly the same message, the end of a relationship, sadness, loneliness. Uh, and that is a common uh, refrain in songs, uh, of course. And it's a humor perspective. But you know, God has a perspective on that three-letter word, one, that's quite a bit different. And I think, and I, I have found it, and I hope that that will be the case for all of you today, that it's actually a very inspiring one and a very encouraging one, and it's one that, I, again, we'll focus on today. And we'll spend most of our time in one passage. It's a passage that we read quite often during the Passover season, which isn't that far away, and that is in John 17. John 17, if you recall, is a prayer that Christ gives and makes to his father just before his crucifixion. Some people describe this prayer or call this prayer the high priest or the high priestly prayer because it's an intercessory, if I could say that word, in nature. He's praying for his disciples. Some call it the Lord's Prayer because clearly the Lord is giving the prayer. So we're going to take a look at that. We're going to deconstruct it. And I think we're going to find out a few things, which I hope, again, you find very helpful and encouraging. So if you want to turn to John 17, we'll start in verse 11. We'll jump around a little bit as we go through this section of Scripture. But the first point, I have seven. Harking back to the old days, I got seven points if I get to all of them. Uh, anyway, the first point is, our becoming one, all of you sitting out there today, all of those watching at home, our becoming one is very important to Jesus Christ and the Father. Let's then look at chapter 17, verse 11. In the prayer, he says, Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, so that they may be one as we are. What is he talking about? Why is he praying about this at this point in time? Verse 20, we want to jump down a few verses. He repeats this. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's all of us sitting out here today. That they all may be one. There he goes again. As you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be, you guessed it, one, that the world may believe that you sent me. Verse 22, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. Over and over again, Jesus Christ makes a similar refrain. And of course, Jesus Christ is our creator. He is our savior. So let's not let the fact that he repeats this over and over become boring to us because this is clearly of great importance to him. Let's take a moment to look at the, the, the Greek there per Thayer's lexicon. The word for one here is spelled H-E-I-S, heis, I suppose, or ice, I'm not sure. It is a cardinal number that expresses quantity. So it could mean just a quantity of one. So he wants us to be one, a quantity of one. It also can be used to to imply or to carry the meaning of is, is, is opposed to being many. So not divided, it also can mean not to be divided or not to be in dissension, particularly in matters of ethics and morality. So that is the meaning that that word one carries that he has now referenced, I think, four times, if my math is correct. So let's take a moment to think about this and deconstruct it. Uh, I will say that you know we read this and I'm getting ahead of myself, but we read this at a certain time of year. I think you know what I'm talking about. But when we read it, I, I find it a little bit overwhelming because there's so much here. So, but let's try to unpack a bit of it and see what we can gather from this. So Christ here provides what I would say a fourfold witness, at least, 
that's how you count it, to the need for us to become one in this prayer. We know the scripture, I'll paraphrase it, but there's a scripture that says, let a matter be established in the in mouth of two to three witnesses. So the fact that he references this multiple uh, of four, I think makes it quite clear uh, if we need any clarity at this point. And then he, he also notes that besides asking the father to make this happen, he also notes that he actually has done something, something about it himself. He says, I have given them the glory which you gave me so that they may be one. He has taken a concrete step to make that happen. Do we ever think about the glory that Jesus Christ has given us? Certainly you could ask, well, what does that mean? I think certainly we could talk in terms of the Holy Spirit, the sharing of his word, but he clearly says he has taken a step, a very important step to make sure that we are one. And I think it's also worth looking at the fact of the timing of this request. I mentioned, of course, it's the prayer, it's right before his crucifixion. And so we've had messages in not too distant past where we, you've been asked the question, if you knew you were going to die in a couple of weeks or days, where would your mind go? What would you focus on? Clearly Jesus Christ knew that he was going to die in a very short period of time. And so we, we, we see from the point of emphasis of four references, we see from the point that as he approaches death, this is what he is thinking about. So there's, it's undeniable how important it is to him. And of course, we could add, if you want to call the cherry on top, who do you, does he ask to make this a reality? He asks the most, the sovereign supreme ruler of the universe to make this a reality. So I probably beat that horse to death, but I will confess, I've heard this scripture many, many times in my years in the church, and I'm not sure it's ever quite cut through the fog deep enough to realize the impact I think Christ wants us to have. The church has always, of course, placed a very heavy emphasis on God's word, but I think you would agree with me when you, we start to think that this passage of scripture is almost every year, at least to some degree or another, John 17 is read during the Passover. So you can say that the church has given an extra weight to this set of scriptures, uh, this prayer by Jesus Christ. And of course, as I said, Passover is not that far away. So I hope this maybe helps us all to kind of get in a frame of mind uh, as we approach that very meaningful time of year. I did ask, I was kind of curious, I couldn't quite remember, I've been baptized for many years now, <laughs> But I did ask two long-time pastors, how long has the church read these scriptures? Is this, is this a 20-year phenomenon? Has this been around forever? And at least in their memory, it goes back probably at least 50 years. So we've been reading these scriptures for a very long time, and we'll read them again, uh, um, Mr. Burnett assured me, uh, here in, in a few weeks. So a lot of weight, but all that to say why, the, the proverbial, the important question of why, why is it so important to God that we become one? Well, let's go to back to John 17. If you don't really have to leave that chapter for a while. And I will say, um, always important to be honest, I was kind of taken aback uh, and very impressed when I read this again, because I'm not sure it's hit me the way that I think it probably should. John 17, verse 20, let's look at that. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I knew that they also may be one in us. Now here's, here's the first why. So that the world may believe that you sent me. And I have to say, I'm not sure I've ever really focused on that scripture sufficiently. He is saying that our becoming one is part of fulfilling his plan so that the world in turn can believe that God the Father sent Jesus Christ to this earth. Us, all of us sitting here, standing here today, have an incredible role to play in God's very plan for the entire T of mankind. And it's right there in verse 21. And if we keep going, we'll get a, additional color and depth. Let's go to verse 22. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I and them, and you and me, that they may be perfect, made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, he repeats that again, and 
have loved them as you have loved me. There's a ton of meaning and a ton of importance being placed on this by Jesus Christ uh, in us becoming one. We have an incredible role to play in, in, in making this come true. It's clear, it's here, it's clear to me. I think it's a, uh, I read, I checked the, the most recent book that we have to publish on prayer, which is part of the five tools for spiritual growth. And, and in that book, they talk, do talk about this prayer to some degree. And I think we're, what I'm saying is not uh, in contradiction to anything that's in that book or anything that I've ever heard in the church. If I'm wrong, I guess someone will tell me. But this is a way to show the world that it, God has loved them, that Jesus Christ has loved them, as you, the Father, have loved me. Again, to me, that's an incredible thing. So we have three stunning reasons, which I'll sum up why becoming one is so important to Jesus Christ and God. Again, that the world may believe that God sent him, that the world may know that you have sent him and loved them as you loved me. And finally, and this is not least, they, that they may be made perfect in one. The word perfect, as we probably generally know, it means to bring to an end, to complete, to perfect. So again, there's a ton of meaning and importance. And I hope that you find that encouraging. I found, as I looked at the commentaries on this subject, this set of scriptures, one that I thought did a nice job of summing it up. This is from the pulpit commentary, and this is how they describe the meaning they believe uh, resides in these verses. The spiritual life and unity of the church will produce an impression on the world which now rejects the Christ and does not appreciate his divine commission. The union which springs from the blended life of the various and even contradictory elements in the church, will provide the reality of its origin. The world will believe. This is the final purpose of this intercession, the prayer that he, uh, he's re referring to, concerning the disciples. So though, so though above he did not pray for the world, per se, as a then immediate object of his intercession, the poor world is in his heart and the saving of the world, the end of his incarnation. Now, that said, let's think about our beliefs. We don't believe that today is the only day of salvation. We do believe that God will give everyone a chance to be saved, everyone will have uh, that chance to understand the truth. We talk about that every year on the last great day. And as I read what this author writes here, while he certainly is not arguing for our beliefs, per se, I do believe it's easy to see those words against the frame or the filter of what we do believe and saying that our example, our coming, becoming one is a key part of all of that coming to be. So as we sit here today, maybe our lives get a little uh, routine, a little uh, rote, uh, a little demanding, but hopefully this maybe energizes our view of what it is that God wants us to do. And, stresses or uh, again makes the point clear that it's a very important and an amazing role that we have to play. Let's look at one other verse. We'll actually leave John for just a moment. Uh, first John, uh, sorry, first John, apparently I can't leave it. First Corinthians chapter one and we'll start reading in verse 27. Paul addresses this in, a, in, a, in quite a different way but I think he helps explain maybe a little bit why God is doing what he's doing uh, in us becoming one, in us being a, a, a proof that God sent Jesus Christ to this earth. It's all part of God's, uh, what he's working out here below. Verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to do what? To put to shame the wise. There is a purpose that he's working out within us to reach the world, and this is put in different terms. Verse, and then as we continue, God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Again, it emphasizes how it's going to be worked out. We have a role in that clearly. And then finally, if I can uh, find my place here, verse 28, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. So maybe we don't see our calling quite as vividly as we should sometimes. It's not uncommon as life kind of beats us down, but I think it's incredible and I think it's very inspiring and I hope that you find that to be true. So as we move forward in the message, one key element of us becoming one that Christ 
talks about is that we are to become one as Christ and the Father are one. So it's worth, of course, exploring that for a little bit, I think. How are Christ and the Father one? Well, we'll go back to John 17. A lot of imagination in this, in this message. I just thought, well, there's one, one scripture. Let's just stick there. But, uh, but I do think there's a, a lot to be talking, to, be, to explore. So John 17, let's look at how are God, the Father, and Christ one? I'm sure you could come up with some answers on your own. But let's look at a few here. Let's start in John 17, and let's start in verse 4. Christ says, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world, wa world was. Verse 6, I've manifested your name to the men whom you've given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Verse 8, I've given to them the words which you have given to me, and they have received them. They have known that I have came forth from you. Verse 10, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. So again, a lot there. Here's a list that I pulled from it which I hope, uh, think summarizes uh, what he had to say. First of all, they had the same work. They had the same mission. They had the same cause. They were about that business. One of our deacons here, Mr. Westbury, used to, used to say, we need to be about our father's business. That was one of his favorite um, uh, comments or verses, as I recall. They had the same glory, as we read in verse 5. They were focused on the same group of people. And they use the same words. Those are a few things we can draw out of that prayer. So with that in mind, let's turn those areas of oneness, if you will, upon ourselves. Many times as we greet each other, maybe meet each other for the first time, we may say, so what line of work are you in? Are you a teacher, a plumber, a sales rep, an engineer, an accountant, an entrepreneur, the answer could be yes to any of those, right? But let me ask you a question. It's not shocking, it's not an epiphany, but does God want us to put a word in front of those occupational titles as we think about what it is that we do when we go to work every day? I think he does. Uh, you may not agree, but I think he does. And what word would that be? I think that word would be Christian. Now, that could sound hokey, perhaps, but it shouldn't. You should be a Christian doctor, a Christian teacher, a Christian engineer, a Christian sales rep, whatever, because really the main reason we are here on this earth is to do God's will. And the task that we do, whether we're putting stitches in someone's hand or we are giving advice on how to save money on taxes or whatever it, it might be, has to be seen through that prism of what does God want us to do? That's what I think he wants us to do. So with that question to ask, let's ask another one going back to God and Jesus Christ. Elements of oneness. What group of people are you most focused on? Now, if you're a school teacher, you spend all day at school and there's little kids maybe running around. So you may say, well, I'm most focused on them because it takes all my time and I have no energy for anything else. Or maybe you're in a professional role and you have a roster of clients. You spend all your time with these folks. That's, of course, reasonable and it's part of what we have to do but what folk what group of focus a group of people should we be most focused on well we know the scripture that we are to do good to all men but especially the household of faith so my point simply is this we can't forget to do the latter uh, in our busy lives i don't i don't think that we tend to do that but it certainly is easy to let that happen because we can be so busy with the other that maybe we've kind of forgotten the members of the household of faith. But we cannot do that. Keep going. What words do we share with others? No, it's fine to talk about sports. It's fine to talk about the weather. It's fine to talk about what line of work you're in. But do we ever talk about the scriptures with one another? Now, I've seen that misused over the years. Sometimes people, I think, do that to show how spiritual they are. And that's not the idea. But you know, maybe talking about a point in the uh, message uh, or something you read in one of the publications, do you, you do that? I think we do, but maybe we don't do it quite enough. Those words should be in our hearts, just like they were in Jesus Christ's heart. He came to this world to do the job he was given to do. 
So if we have the same work, focus on the same group of people, we can share in that oneness with God. But I think there's something else, because as you look in verse 21, let's go back to John 17, verse 21, it says that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us. So how can we be in each other? How can we be in God and Jesus Christ? Well, let's use the expression that we, it's fairly common. If you are in trouble, if you are in debt, if you are in your element, what does that mean? Well, I think it could be described as you are in, you are surrounded by a set of circumstances. If it's trouble, well, it's something's going wrong and you're uh, under siege by whatever. It's all around you. You are engulfed by it. So I think that's a reasonable way to look at that, answer that question. Or if you're in your element, you love jazz music and you're at a jazz festival, you're just, you're just soaking it all in. It's, it's, you're completely immersed in what you love. So with that said, are we in one another? Are we immersed with one another and growing in shared faith and shared belief? Are we in God and Jesus Christ and their work and their words as we've already described? Are you and I in or out? So I've already shared and you already know that this passage of scripture in John 17 is a prayer. And when we pray, of course, all of us want to have prayers answered. So I think it's worthwhile taking a moment to ask and answer the question, well, did Jesus Christ's prayer for the disciples then and the disciples now, us, has it been answered? And if so, how did it get answered? Well, to do that, we will go to a different book. You're welcome. We'll, we'll go to a different book today. Uh, and we'll look at a, a, a few scriptures which show, as you would guess, that yes, that prayer was answered. And it was answered in short order for the church that began on the day of Pentecost. And this has been talked about before, of course, from the from this pulpit or lectern. Uh, but there's a word that, repeat, that shows up quite often in the first several chapters of the book of Acts. It's homo thumadon, uh, you want to show off your Greek, and it shows up again, as I said, in multiple verses. And what does it mean? It means to be of one mind, to be un unanimous in thought, with one accord. You may have heard that somewhere. Uh, or at the same time, one accord at the same time. So let's see, let's look at a few verses where that Greek word shows up, and let's see what, how we got answered by God. You want to turn to the book of Acts chapter 1 and verse 14. It said, these all continued with one accord, that's that word, homo thumadon, in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Acts 2, verse 46. You could turn or just listen, whatever you prefer, of course. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Acts 4, verse 24. So when they heard that, they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God, you made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. And we'll go down to one last verse here. Um, Acts chapter 8 and verse 6. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So I'll, I'll attempt to once again provide a bit of a summary of what is said in these verses. But clearly, they were of one mind, and that prayer was answered. So what do we see? What are some of the characteristics of this oneness? Well, First of all, there were people gathering or assembling together, okay? They were speaking the same thing. They were sharing with one another. They were praying together for a common goal, and they were heeding the words of God's servants. So then let's turn quickly to the next question. What about all of us here today, some 2,000 years later? Has God answered that prayer for us? Now, those guys are kind of famous. That's the early church. We look to Acts all the time. But what about us? Verse 5. Well, here's a few things you could come up with your own list. We're all here today. Everyone sitting in this room today made a decision. 
to come here, which exhibits being of the same mind. Clearly, you could have done something else. You've come to church, you're assembling. We sang three hymns, I think, earlier, and we all did it together. What about things where we're not assembled? We all, hopefully, are tithing. We all, hopefully, are giving regular offerings on the holy days. We all, when we can, attend the feast. These are all like-minded, one-minded examples of one, us being of one mind, of showing that oneness that Jesus Christ so earnestly desired. But, you know, uh, let me cover one other. I, I think it's also helpful to think about that. And there were two others. We also pray at the beginning, at the end of each service, and this can become, I think, easily somewhat rote. Okay, service is over, let's pray. But do we really think about what the gentleman says? Don't want to put any pressure on the prayer giver today. But we do say amen at the end of the prayer, most of us, which is a sign that we agree we are in one mind as to what was just said. And lastly, we fellowship with one another. We talked about breaking bread earlier. So we do that. There's food sitting at the leave in the snacks room. I don't want to get in trouble. I think we're having snacks to get today, but I saw some earlier. Maybe it's all gone. Okay, so a lot of talk about oneness. What about a threat to oneness? Didn't take long in the accounts and acts to have a story come to the fore where that oneness was threatened. If you want to give it a simple little idiom or a proverb to try to sum up what happened there, we have an account where two people were trying to have their cake in their hand and eating it at the same time, which are physically impossible things. You cannot have your cake and keep it if you've eaten it. But they wanted to do that. And of course, you probably know who we're talking about, or who I'm talking about, Ananias and Sapphira. If you want to turn to the book of Acts, chapter 5, verse 1, first nine or ten verses there, we get the account of what happened. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm, I'm not going to read every verse, but I'll read a few here. A certain man named Ananias with Sapphira's wife sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, wasn't it your own? And after it was sold, wasn't it in your own control? Now, we know the story quite well, but I think there's something interesting going here on here that maybe, at least I haven't thought about before, because if you think about it, they had this wealth, they had this land, whatever it was, how much it was, we don't know. But if they wanted to keep it, why didn't they just say, you know what, this whole church business is for the birds. I got all these, you know, if you go back to chapter four for some context, by the way, I won't turn to the verse, but there are several examples of other members selling property and donating for the use of the church. So this story with Ananias and Sapphira comes on the heels of that happening. So put yourself in their shoes. You see a big happening, if you will, a lot of going on in the church. There's a lot of fervor. It's a lot of excitement in these people. Well, look at them. They're giving land. They're bringing money here. We're selling. We're helping other people. And so Ananias and Sapphira, it would seem, said, you know what? That, I want to be part of that. And I want to be in the church, but I don't want to really, I want it to be kind of. I want, I want to give some of it, but I don't want to give all of it. But I want you to think I'm giving every bit of it trying to have their cake and eat it, too. And so we know the very terrible and chilling end that those, those two came to face. And so sometimes in our lives, uh, we talked about being one, of course. We talked about not having dissension with God's will, not being divided in our thinking. And clearly, they were. And clearly, as human beings, it's pretty easy to fall into that, at least in some ways. Maybe not at the level that they did, but as we begin to perhaps do some self-examination as, again, the spring holy days draw near, uh, what are we holding back from God? Do we say we're all in, but maybe there's still something we just can't let go of, but we want to be around everybody well, we just can't quite let go of it. I think if we're honest, there probably is a, a little something, a little carnality 
a little lack of faith, a little bit of this that we might still be holding on to. But not to worry, of course. God understands our struggle, and he can help us overcome. So as we wrap things up here, what is our role? Well, if you turn to the book of Acts, chapter 2, and we read verse 37, Peter does a nice job of summing up some things because he was asked a question too. Acts 2, verse 37, as he had given his sermon, he said, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off. And he continues, verse 40, be saved from this perverse generation. Verse 41, then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. They continued steadfastly in what? The apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and prayers. So I think I'm listing you to death, so forgive me. <laughs> so we want to add a list. What might we need to do? What is our role in becoming one? Well, continually to seek repentance, to ask God to help you gladly receive his word, to continue steadfast in the apostles' doctrine, to continue to fellowship, to share meals, to pray for the common purpose and God's will be done in the church. And here's the last one, a bit of a speculation, but maybe we need to get ready to have all things in common just as they did. No, of course, I am not a prophet, but it would not surprise me. I could certainly see that maybe God would want that to happen in some way to see if we would be willing to give up our possessions to help a brother or a sister in the faith. And clearly, there's generosity all the time in the church. That's not what I'm saying. But maybe it will come to a real kind of a... a pivotal point that's somewhat akin to what happened in those days. So I hope that I've been able to show the importance from God's perspective of why it's important to become one and how incredible and how wonderful and how fantastic it is and what an incredible role God has given us to help the world come to see that actually he sent Jesus Christ and he loved us and Jesus Christ. Again, maybe you want to go back and read that. I think it's a little challenging to kind of get your mind around. But that is the role, it's part of the role that we have to fulfill. And so if we do that, uh, we will become one and we will have one. <laughs>